I was going to bring it round to um, Tanith's sort of legacy and the fact that, um, you know, she's written 90 novel, 90 books, 300 short stories, and influenced, you know, if you just look at the table of contents of this book, or even everything from China Mieville, who isn't in this book, but to, you know, Martha Wells, to Terry Windling, to you, to, you know, such a broad swath of different kinds of writers. And yet, um, she's not terribly well known. Um, and no, how No, she's not. Part of that, part of that, I think, is just that she she was so prolific. Where do you start? Part of that is that so much of the work is short fiction, uh, which which can be tend to be ephemeral uh, if you don't get canonized. And and where is the canon now? For example, are we still reading the short stories that were on the Hugo and Nebula and World Fantasy Ballad even ten years ago? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, it depends. Is the author still around, still busy inflicting themselves on us? You know, that's hard to do. Um, the uh, but I think that so that I think that the young writers and the young readers of today and, and uh, readers and writers of any age, if they are increasingly fascinated in the things that like Victor Laval is doing with the uh, the rewrites of Lovecraft. Um, uh, uh, her name just flew, just flew out of my head. Who else is uh, from Baltimore that's also doing the Lovecraft revisions, rethinking? I'll I'll think of I'll think of her name and after we're recording, I apologize. Um, people that are people that are reading. The uh, the uh, anything that is about um, that really darkly interrogates um, the have nots of society, which so much which so much Sam Miller is doing, which so much uh, so many of today's major writers are doing. I think that they would find a lot to embrace in in the work of Tanith Lee, who was who was doing that sort of thing um a generation ago. Yeah. Uh just this if, if, do you mind if I read a paragraph? Oh. Um this is this is from this is the first paragraph of Tanith's story, Il est Troy La Mort, uh which I which uh was in the Whispers Four volume. That came out, has to be 80s, 1983 from Doubleday, one of those Doubleday, okay, so I'm, I'm pretty sure I read this on publication, but this was the first paragraph of it, it's a short paragraph. Across the river, the clock of Notre Dame a Lumiere was striking seven. How deep the river and how dark and how many bones lying under it that the strokes of the great gilded clock upon the Gothic tower winged with its lace work did not rouse. Down there, all those who had thrown themselves from the bridges off the quays of the city, the starving, the sick and the drugged, the desperate and the insane. That's the first paragraph. So it's, it's like it's like this cine, it's like this cinematic. Here's the beautiful skyline, and then you pass down, and then you get even even as the prose is as beautiful as the intricate you know uh, intricacies of the architecture. Then you get down to the quays and the rivers and what's floating there, and all the the people that have come to the river, and and that and 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 that. That directs your attention right where Tanith wanted it. What wanted it's, it directed? You know the the I, lives and the struggles there. I was going to say, and it said the tone is so immediately dark, like um, emotionally dark. You know, 
because you immediately, you know, flash to all the way, sort of all the hidden things around you in your own life as well. You no, know? as far as your imagination can take you, that setup can like ties to it. And it's really quite, I think that's one of the things that for me, you know, you talk about plot and, and language character writers who focus on those kind of being considered somewhat different is that she somehow managed to do, write these evocative, you know, beautiful and yet um, emotionally um, tight, emotionally really grabbing you immediately. And at the same time, she's also doing setup for plot. You know, she somehow managed to do both. And that is an incredibly elusive skill, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Like, and, I wish I could and there's, that. There's so, <laughs> they're, mm -hmm. they're so felt, these stories, yeah, they line are. by line, paragraph to paragraph. I mean, we then meet a character who's standing there staring at the water. So we are immediately with that character, you know, don't go in the water, <laughs> you know, um, but, but the, um, and, and you're right. How do you do all that at once? Well, she did. Yeah, the, char the characterization, the characterization, the plot, the setting, the, uh, the sound of it, just the, the visualization and, and the message the the, the, the repeated message of the these people matter. These, uh, it's it's uh, it's not it's not just the haves. It's the have-nots, and the have-nots do a lot of having too. You know, the have-nots and the once wers. How about that? Yes, that's right. The once wers or the never the never were. Um. I but but when she when she wrote about the upper classes, it was very often the upper class rebel, the one who had to break out, the one the the bird in the gilded cage, who had to. Uh, where's um, there's bird. another one. I, I can't I can't find. I won't be able to find it now. But there's another one about how the uh, that ends with uh, ends with how they. They keep looking for the Duchess or whatever, and she had just turned up missing, and nobody ever saw her again because you know that she like just lit out for the territories, you know. Well, you know, I'll um, I'll give you one example from her novels because she had so many novels, but um, first one of the first tenth books I read, a lot of you know teenagers read is the uh, Silver Medal Lover, which was all about a gilded cage. That's know? right. Yep. 